Welcome to the second lecture in this brief series of Intonation and Meaning. Have you got a handout? I said, um, I set three questions at the beginning of the lecture yesterday. The first two were very theoretical, and the first lecture yesterday was indeed highly theoretical. Um, I hope not too off the radar for some of you, but of interest to some also, I hope. The third question that I set yesterday was, and it's the one printed on uh, C, on the handout, can we make any generalizations about intonation? And are these, are these generalizations of any use to teachers and learners? So today's lecture is going to be concerned, um, on the face of it at least, with generalizations about intonation. But there are a few things to say before I launch into generalizations. The first thing is to say that since intonation, or the meaning conveyed by intonation, is context dependent, since it is at the very least not clear that it's a semantic issue, we have to be very wary of making generalizations. Since a given contour with a, per with a particular set of words may be appropriate, with another set of words, it might be entirely inappropriate. So I'm kind of starting off by saying I'm going to give you generalizations and then doing what all cowardly lecturers do and say, well, actually, I can't make many. Um, what I'm going to do essentially in the next sort of 20 minutes or so is give you as much, as, as much guidance as I can to generalizations. It'll be more of a list, I think, than anything of appropriate features. I'll also try and point out any pitfalls that there are with adopting certain contours on certain expressions, and hopefully it will be with, of some help. Towards the end of the lecture, I will indeed stick my neck out and make a few generalizations, the final one of which will be possibly, I think, the most important, but it's still slightly untested and um, not completely set in stone. So, I mean, it's up to you, as particularly the teachers among you, to see if these things are useful for learners and for the students of you to see if they're useful for you as students. So you've got quite a big handout, apologies for this because I had a complete nightmare, the printer broke and these have been copied somewhere on the other side of London and photocopied and brought over here. Section two is the section we'll turn to next, pitch as a discourse organiser. This was something I touched on in the um, talk yesterday and I just want to, I'll probably repeat myself a little bit, I'll also probably repeat things that you've heard in your intonation class from your tutor. So here's the first subsection, 2.1, tone and information status. It is generally true to say that falling tones can be used to signal completeness. If you remember, that was one of the claims of O'Connor and Arnold yesterday. And it is generally true. It's not always true, but it is generally something that we can generalize about. And rising or level tones can often be used to signal incompleteness, or at least continuity. The classic example of this is lists. And here's um, a couple of lists in one and two. In one, if I say I've got tea, coffee, or lemonade, they are the three things I've got because the fall signals completeness. If I say I've got tea, coffee, or lemonade, that's good news to you if you want milk, because it signals that that might not be the end of the list. Telephone numbers, it's the same. Uh, my UCL number is 0207 679 3167. Okay, you hear the fall, and that's the end of the phone number. Addresses also Department of Phonetics and Linguistics, UCL, Gower Street, London, WC1 6BT. Okay. The fall is the end of my address. So they're nice examples of rises signaling incompleteness and falls signaling completeness. That is a generalization that you can use. And to be honest with you, um, we had, I had a meeting with uh, Michael at the very beginning of this course. And this kind of thing about saying an address or saying a phone number is very much something that we tend to look at at the end of this course. But actually, 
if you've got a phone number here in London, it, you should probably learn how to say it properly on the first day of the course. Because you might need to say it, and there's nothing worse, and I, this has happened to me, with having an address or a phone number to say in a foreign language, and saying it in what you think is a perfect enunciation, but you've just got the wrong intonation pattern and the person is finding it hard to follow. So, they're nice examples to use with, with students. Um, a couple of other generalizations about rising and falling. In conversation, falling to a lower pitch often not only means that you've completed your sentence or your utterance, sometimes it also indicates that you've finished your turn. Okay? It signals that actually that's the end of what you're going to say, and it's a cue for your interlocutor to begin what they're going to say. In the same way, keeping, up, keeping going up is a way of sort of saying, not yet, I haven't finished. Okay, so in turn taking, rises and falls are also important. Um, and the final uh, little generalization that we can make, although there are exceptions to this, and I'll turn to perhaps some of the ways of explaining these exceptions later, was actually these examples I used from yesterday's lecture, which signal the relative importance of word groups in a single utterance. So the example was, what will you be doing when Skep is over? I'll stop thinking about phonetics when Skep is over. The rise signals given and the fall signals new. And this, will you ever stop thinking about phonetics? I'll stop thinking about phonetics when Skep is over. Okay, again, the given and new are contrasted with the rise and the fall. Okay, point two, point two. Key and information status. Now, I'm not sure how much Patricia talked about key. Has she talked about it? So everybody's comfortable? I mean, if she has talked about it, I won't say too much, but the basic idea is that we've all got a kind of pitch range of our voice between low and high. And the key, it's like a musical key almost, it's where we are within the complete range of our voice. So if we're in a high key, then we're sort of, even our lows are relatively mid for us. Okay? So, um, very often, if we start a new topic, we will start in a high key. Okay? And then as the, as the topic, or whatever we're saying, is beginning of drawing to a close, we will slowly lower the key. And a really good place to listen to that, if any of you don't believe me, is BBC Television News. Okay, it's an absolute classic, and I don't know whether they are trained to do it, but they certainly appear as if they're trained to do it. They will introduce a new subject in a very high key, and I think you're supposed to go, wow, it's the news. And then as the story goes on, it gets lower and lower, and you get more and more bored. <laughs> okay, also, the relation between this notion of key, which was... Um, made popular by David Brazel, who I also mentioned yesterday, and high falls and low falls is slightly complicated. But here's another example of how adopting a high key can kind of give a slightly emphatic meaning or a, an impression that, that something is slightly unexpected. So if I say in response to this question, how's your brother getting on with his driving lessons? He took his test last week and passed. That's a low key, a low fall, and it's almost like he passed and you expected it. But if the response, how's your brother getting on with his driving lessons, he took his test last week and passed, <laughs> that indicates that you're actually surprised or even amazed. And notice again, just going back to what we talked about yesterday, the movement of my eyebrows and my head when I said, and passed. <laughs> okay? There is a certain parallel between them those movements. Okay, so, I mean, tone and information status, key and information status, there are generalizations that you can make about that. There will always be exceptions, but there are generalizations. Another area that you can make a few generalizations, and I think is useful for teachers and students, is question intonation. And I've got a short section here with lots of examples, and I'll try and demonstrate them as best I can, but they're all marked up. And if any of your, 
If any of these are not clear, then I'm sure your tutors will be happy to sort of look over them in the next class. Okay, polar questions or yes/no questions. These are just these are questions where the, an answer can be either yes or no. A safe choice is going to be a simple rise or sometimes a full rise. A full rise will kind of indicate something a bit more like curiosity, whereas just the normal rise will be casual, slightly more casual. So compare, for example, is this your first time in London? That's a polite, normal question. Is this your first time in London? If you do a higher rise, it sounds a bit more casual. Have you had a good day? Have you had a good day? That's more casual, but still quite polite. If you say, do you like phonetics? That sounds a bit curious. If you say, do you like phonetics? That sounds amazed. And again, the emphasis will change your attitude that you, that, that you want to con convey. Having said that, and it's probably one of the most common um, things that, at least in my experience of teaching English in Portugal, uh, was that, of course, many questions in English are perfectly okay with a following tone. And in Portuguese, generally speaking, there's a, there's a rising tone, and students always want to rise. But you can tell your students it's fine to fall, particularly with WH questions. Will you be staying on in London? Okay, that's example 11. Have you finished your homework? Have they decided on a date for the election? Depending on the kind of fall you use, it can sound a bit like a demand for information. Okay, but that's also going to depend on the relationship you have with the person you're speaking to. If when you arrive in Heathrow Airport, the, the person who asks you about how, the purpose of your visit is not going to stay, are you staying long? <laughs> they're, not, they're not trying to sort of be friendly. They will say, how long are you staying? Okay, or even worse, length of visit, <laughs> and that kind of horrible mid-tone, name, <laughs> nationality. Anyway, um, in the case of echo questions, even if they're WH questions, you will tend to get a rise or a full rise. An echo question is simply when you repeat a question that you've just been asked. So if somebody says, will you be staying on in London? You can say, will I be staying on in London? Or something like that. Or have they decided on a date for the election? It's an echo of the previous question and you rise, even though it's a WH question. Declarative questions, turning to 16 and 17, these are just statements that actually, given the pronunciation, become questions. So something like, you're specialising in English language? Or coffee? Or gin and tonic? Or cigarette? Any of those. And finally, a group of... Uh, questions of, of yes, no questions that give learners difficulties, tag questions. The commonest types of tag questions, as I'm sure most of you know, have what they call reverse polarity. So you have a positive followed by a negative tag, or a negative followed by a positive tag. But the kind of intonation that you put on these questions is going to affect the kind of answer that you expect. It will actually sometimes render it not particularly a question, more just a request for confirmation. So, if we say 18 with a fall, these socks are yours, aren't they? The expected answer is yes. They haven't finished yet, have they? Again, the expected answer is no, they haven't. These socks are yours, aren't they? If you're not sure, maybe they're not. That's a genuine question. Also, they haven't finished yet. Have they? That's also a genuine question. For 
for, for, for learners, from, um, again from my own teaching experience, in lots of the English textbooks that I used to use, they only really concentrate on the tag itself when they say, well, it's either rising or falling. But actually the tone of the word group before is important too. And you can kind of give your students patterns over the whole pair of word groups rather than just the tag itself. Okay, next section, some more questions. Alternative questions. So these are questions that aren't asking for yes or no. In fact, yes or no is a highly inappropriate response <laughs> to a question like these. You're simply giving an option. And it's very common for these to sort of sound a bit like a list, a rise and then a fall. Would you like tea or coffee? You can't say yes. You might try, but you won't get both. Are you asking me or telling me? Okay, same thing. Notice with the high fall at the end, it sounds a bit more agitated, possibly irritated. Are you asking me or telling me? Again, eyebrows. Okay, um, the next group, which will be the sort of last group of questions, information questions. As I've said, with these WH questions, generally speaking, a fall is fine. A high fall is probably the best idea. It's something of a dangerous thing to do to put a low fall on it. Think about those people who ask you the questions at the airport. What time is your flight? High fall. What time is your flight? Sounds friendly, it sounds interested. What time is your flight? Have you packed yet? <laughs> it's that kind of thing you're communicating. So, you know, it's, if you say, what time is your flight? It's like you're tapping your watch or something like that. And you're across. So be wary of low falls. In fact, in general, keep the key high. So I thought a few generalizations about information status with tone and key was a good idea. There are certain um, aspects of intonation that perhaps generalizing over is, is an inappropriate word. These kind of aspects of intonation have become ritualized in a certain way. The kind of intonation patterns you use on certain words, for example, of greetings, of goodbyes, of farewells, the pattern themselves become quite ritualized. So you can kind of teach them almost in that way. You can teach the intonation or alternative intonations as part of the lexical unit itself, if you like. Now, of course, these exchanges, greetings, farewells, thank yous, etc., the purpose of them is not really to exchange information at all. They're more like either introductions to discourse or the ends of discourse or keeping the machine of discourse well lubricated, making sure that everything runs uh, smoothly. Nonetheless, certain patterns are suited to certain situations, and I'll try and run through a few of those with you. Uh, excuse me for a minute while I have a drink. Is the battery still? Yeah, I can hear that. Okay, so let's start with um, greetings. You've, I mean, for those of you who have come, have come to England for the first time, and I know a lot of my Japanese students are here in England for the first time, are sort of hearing words like hello and hi, things like that for the first time, with these particular intonation patterns. Generally speaking, the kind of uh, default greeting, if you like, in English is hello. And it's perfectly okay to say that with a fall, so long as you're using a sort of relatively high key, keeping it friendly. Hello, hello, like that. Um, in fact, in some, I mean, my, it becomes ritualized sometimes to a point where it's actually quite strange because I'll just share a little bit of personal information with you here. My daughter, my 12 year old daughter is in New York at the moment and I spoke to her on the phone and it was only yesterday because I was thinking about this lecture, she said, Hello! <laughs> and I said, hello! <laughs> and I suddenly wondered, where on earth does that 
that all come from? <laughs> but it's just what I always say to her. And then my six-year-old daughter came on the phone and said, hello. <laughs> So some of these things become ritualised within kind of mini, I mean, I don't know whether the, the other English people here, Margaret, do you say hello? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, okay. <laughs> 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 I had a real panic attack about that last night. I thought that was uh, some sort of deviant grammar I was using. <laughs> so long as you keep it relatively high, it's fine. Okay, if you say hello, <laughs> it's not great. Okay, but these things are kind of, common sense to a certain extent. Just keep it high in English at least. Um, sometimes it's appropriate to use a slightly different intonation pattern. If you're trying to establish contact with somebody, or if you're trying to um, reassure somebody, in particular a child, you can use a rise at the end and you'd probably use something like high prehead. That's marked up in 26. So, hello. Hello. It's, it's kind of if you come across a little child who's lost in the street, and you'd say, you know, hello, like that. You wouldn't say, hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So you'd say, hello. And that's another, I mean, it's also good for attracting attention. Hello, like that. Um, or if you're surprised. If you're surprised, so there's a couple in 27 there. Hello, fancy meeting you. Hello, this is a surprise. Okay, and uh, that's something that sometimes English speakers use if actually they're not very happy to see somebody. So if you've been, if you've seen somebody, you don't want to speak to them unless they come over. You say, "Hello, this is a surprise." <laughs> okay, a rising tone of "hello" is also pretty common in telephone calls, in tele answering the telephone. I mean, some, um, some countries, well, in fact, when I was a child, I was always taught to say the number. But at some stage in my life, I just say, hello, just a rise, hello. Or you can say the number, 7493. The rise kind of signals that it's their turn. Okay. Um, 29, I'll hand out. The, the first one in hello is if you've been, if, imagine if you've been kept on hold on the telephone, which seems to happen even more nowadays, usually listening to some horrible music. Hello? Somebody's there. Somebody comes back and says, hello? Desperate, there's somebody there. Also, we've got this, uh, on the, on the right-hand side on 29, there's what's called the stylized calling contour. Okay? Hello? Hello? Are you there? Okay, that's very common. Be careful, because it can sound a bit, you know, if it's the sort of thing that an irritated teacher might say if his students are talking. Hello? Okay, but if you keep it in a nice high key, it's absolutely fine. Another good thing, another useful expression for attracting attention, which is perhaps less common now than it used to be when I was younger, is cooey. <laughs> Does anybody say that still? <laughs> Not at all? No. Is, that, is that just me showing my age? So. Okay, well I think that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> I might start some sort of horrible... Uh, yeah, okay, well perhaps you should forget cooey, but um, <laughs> certainly say it in my family a lot. And finally, a sort of hello can also be used as a casual greeting. When, you know, if you're just walking past somebody and you don't have time to stop or something like that, which happens quite a lot on this course. Hello. Hello. You're walking past. Hello. Okay. Let's move on to 412. Um, probably the most common informal greeting that we have is hi. And I'm sure you've all heard that a lot. Um, Generally speaking, a fall is good with hi. A fall either to low, so hi. Or in more casual circumstances, you fall, but only to the sort of mid-level. Hi. Hi. 
Um, using a rise on high is a sort of something you probably want to avoid. High? <laughs> it just, I can't think of any context that you could use it, other than if somebody said hi to you, and you were trying to say, you know, don't say hi, why are you saying that sort of thing? Um, falls and rises are fine on good morning, so good morning, the rise is absolutely fine, good morning, the fall is absolutely fine. Um, very often with morning, and you've probably heard this uh, speaking to the English people that you have to the tutors or who else, very often the, the, the good is just dropped completely and it becomes more like hello, so morning, it's fine, <laughs> you've all heard that, or morning, just <laughs> which is a bit more, a bit like the calling, what well, it is the calling content. Uh, or you can have a rise as well, morning. That's fine too. So with good morning, you're absolutely fine. Um, initial greetings such as hello, good morning, in English are often followed by how are you? Or how are you? A high fall. Um, fine, thanks. How are you? It's kind of ritualized online, almost. How are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? It's sort of, it's, uh, it's what's called well, in pragmatics, we call it phatic communication, because the question, how are you, is not actually really asking for information at all. In fact, if you say, hi, how are you? And somebody says, well, I've got this back. <laughs> and also, a slight trouble. It's not... Hello. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's very good. That's the first time in any lecture, any lecture I've ever given where a student has said hello! <laughs> um, completely through me. The American version of how are you is generally speaking, how you doing? Or how you doing? If you're in New York. Okay, um, what time does this finish? Is it 12 or 11? 12. Okay, so let's move on to some farewells. Polite farewells, and we do try and keep farewells polite, generally speaking, usually end at a kind of mid rather than at a low pitch. Um, also, if we're being quite formal, you can give whatever expression it is you're saying a low rise and a kind of high prehead. So something like, goodbye, goodbye. Starting quite high in my register. Goodbye. Good night. Good day. Avoid, and this I probably should have written this in capital letters, avoid falling to low intonation for farewells. If you say, good day, it's like saying, go. Or at the end of an evening, good night. Okay, it's not a polite way to say it. Good night. Hello. Goodbye. Okay, let's turn over. Um, good day. I don't actually um, have that particularly in my repertoire at all. I don't ever say good day particularly. But as with um, as with morning, uh, the good is often dropped. So bye. Is perfectly good, I'm sure you know. Good night. The good just becomes good. It becomes completely weekend. And see ya. See ya. Um, okay, and I mean, cheers is, I, I, you've probably heard a lot of people say cheers. I mean, cheers can mean goodbye, you know, cheers. Or it can mean thank you, cheers. And it's typically, full, uh, typically pronounced with a kind of shallow fall. Cheers. Okay, let's, um, let's move on to please and thank you. And then just, I want to talk a little bit at the end about 
some sort of newer ideas about these things. Um, if please is a sort of a tag marking a request as polite, it normally takes a lowish rise. So, yes, please. Would you like a drink? Yes, please. Uh, would you like me to email it or send it? Could you send it, please? The rise is appropriate for that. Um, sometimes, of course, it can just be tacked on the end of the same word group, so you get something more like, quiet, please. Okay, the nuclear term is not on please there, it's on quiet. Quiet, please. A kilo of pears, please. Could you send it, please? So please can be in its own word group, have its own uh, rising term, or it can be in the same, in the tail of a, uh, of a nucleus from an earlier syllable. Um, if it's, if please is initial, then it's very often incorporated into the head. So, please could you tell me, etc, etc. Could you please move up? If you, if you say please with a falling nucleus in a separate word group and it comes afterwards, then it actually sounds quite, uh, it, it's like you're adding a sense of urgency to what you're saying that you don't get with the rise. So if you say something like, yes, please, that sounds perfectly okay. If you say, quiet, please, that sounds, that sounds very different. <coughs> I need your cooperation, please. I want you to read the handout, please. <laughs> okay? It adds a, a sort of urgency, and the more you accent it, accentuate it, the urgency sort of stumbles off into desperation, almost. Um, okay, and also, sorry, this is, has this split over the... Oh, no, that's okay. With a full rise, please can sound quite um, pleading. So you get something like, please, please be careful, do take care. Okay, with that full rise, you get more of a sense of pleading. Okay, let's just have a look at thank you. I think I might have to leave apologies until the end. Um, a sincere thank you will always be a sort of, or will very often just be a fall, a high fall. Thank you. Thank you. A sort of routine thank you would be thank you. Thank you. Or even thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and as a, if you add thank you as a final tag, then it often has a kind of low rise, a bit like please. Um, so something like... Uh, no, thank you. Okay. No, thank you. It takes a sort of rise. Okay, I've sort of, I think I'm overshooting on time a bit, so can we just leave 4.4? Um, perhaps some of the tutors could just go over, I mean, you can read it yourself, it's all fairly self-explanatory. Let me just draw your attention to um, some of these generalizations that I've got in the bullet points at the end. And also, I was asked a very interesting question by somebody who's teaching intonation. I just wanted to say a little bit of what I said to them towards at the end of our lecture here. So the first point, and I'll just read through these. In, in casual routine encounters, tunes like the stylized calling contour or the fall to mid level are normal and acceptable. Note, and this is a take-home message that I've tried to stress a few times, the whole exchange will then be in a high register or a high key. Okay? Generally speaking, it's a, it's a sort of fairly safe generalization. Keeping things high is better than keeping things low. Of course, in other situations, there's a choice between a fall to low and some sort of rise. And here, I'm just generalizing over the stuff that I've said before. In the case of farewells, a fall to low sounds dismissive, even hostile. Goodbye. That doesn't sound good. Okay? We like to kind of keep farewells friendly. Okay? 
So try to keep them ending on a sort of mid-level pitch. A point that you will come across in some of some um, intonation books that you see is that some people have tried to associate falls with dominance and rises as deference. But that presumes or implies a kind of inequality between speakers and listeners. That may of course be the case, but generally perhaps isn't. So how can we actually um, get over that problem? How can we get rid of this idea of deference and dominance and inequality and stuff like that? Well, I've given you a reference in the first lecture to a paper of um, Jill Houses, who works in this department, a 2007 paper. And she continues an idea of, um, I think originally in Brazil and also used by Carlos Kussenhoven, of orientation. So the idea is that rather than thinking in terms of deference and dominance, or even in terms of given and old information, we think about intonation as a sort of result of the speaker's intentions. So it's not a property of the discourse, it's something to do with the speaker's attitude. The question that I was asked by this student earlier was, you know, I'm an intonation teacher, I've been using Brazel's book, and he says this stuff that falls are associated with a certain sort of information and rises are associated with a certain sort of information. But you gave some examples yesterday where that's not true, so what can I do? Well, the idea, and this is an idea that people are thinking about and kicking around now, is that it, whether something is a rise or a fall is not to do with the information itself, it's to do with the attitude of the speaker to the information. It's to do with the orientation that the speaker is taking. So when you say a piece of information with a fall, you are asserting it to a certain extent. It's like you're introducing this into the conversation with some commitment to what it conveys. It's not a property of the information itself, it's what you believe about the information. A rise, on the other hand, is where you're saying something in a discourse and perhaps not taking responsibility for it yourself you're sort of almost testing the water with the rise. So whilst you're, you're saying it, you're not necessarily committing yourself to its importance or its role in the discourse. It's like you're orientating, you're, you're, you're giving it to the hearer. You're asking for sort of confirmation or the relevance themselves. Now, that's a sort of interesting idea that people have been talking about for a while. It ties in particularly with the notion of relevance, which is a notion that I use in my thinking in pragmatics. Um, and if any of you are interested in taking that further, there are references in the previous lecture, and I'd be very happy to meet and talk at any time, if you like. Um, it's 5 to 12, but I've said everything I want to say. If anybody has any questions, we've got a few minutes. Nina? Um, I'm just wondering, you know, young people, actually, the influence of um, the I was wondering, you know, young people, perhaps under the influence of so often like neighbors, yeah. now speak in a way when they are making statements, they are still constantly rising. Yeah. That's a really good point. Did anybody get that? The mic stretch that far. Yeah. A really interesting point. I mean, I've got a 12 year old daughter, and it's like. Listening to her and her friends talk, I find physically painful sometimes. <laughs> because they never finish anything. <laughs> what did you do today? Well, I went to Brighton. I went to, went, did some shopping. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bought a game for my Nintendo. <laughs> anything else? No. <laughs> they rise and rise and rise. And it's called, it's called up-talk, I think, or up-speak, up up up-speak. And it's a really common trend. I mean, Jill, actually, Jill House, has written about that in the paper that I refer you to um, in yesterday's lecture, Jill's most recent paper. She's actually got a whole section about up-speak. I think her idea is that it's actually, um, it's a kind of 
sign of belonging to a particular subculture, or you know, it's a sign that you're young. It sort of bonds you. So it's not so much. It doesn't so much have a discourse function. It certainly doesn't for me. But it has almost a social function. Um, but Nina's absolutely right. It, it didn't exist really in this country until the, roughly, as far as I know, the time when Australian soap operas became very popular on television. Yes. Can I say that we have recordings of Cardiff speech and one example of Bristol speech dating back to 1975. Fantastic. So, so upspeak has been around much longer than neighbours. <laughs> which is something of a relief. <laughs> okay, any other points or questions to make? I think I sense people filling their bags up and leaving, so perhaps we'll call it a day. Thank you very much.